Right, so today is the 13th of March, and we're going to study a new volume. Volume 38, yeah? This was actually published last year. Volume 38, the theme is Love and Compassion. This is a very happy book, yeah? It's a long essay on the Buddhist conception of love. In fact, it's the long, one of the longest essays I've written. So, but the first sutta is quite frightening. Eh? The sutta is one of the most, uh, uh, what should I say? You got to read it very carefully, and you got to understand the meaning of the teaching. The first sutta is called Kakachu Pama Sutta. Kakacha means a saw. It's not just a saw. It's a double-handed saw. Very big saw. This is a teaching of non-violence. Uh, it's not an easy concept for lay people like us. But we must remember this teaching is given to the monks and the nuns. In other words, total non-violence. In fact, this teaching is not new. You, you see this practice very common in India. In, in an important way, India won its independence through non-violence, through Mahatma Gandhi, I remember. So this is one of those inspirations of, of these very great men in India, where the, the Buddha says, 100% non-violence, not reacting in any way. You remember we did the last week, no? that Sutta, Puna, Puno Wada Sutta, that this person, this monk, wants to go back to his hometown, to home city, home village, teach. Then the Buddha says, wow, these people there are very violent, you know what he did? For you, and then uh, Buddha says okay, and then there is this gradual uh, scale of uh, suffering. Yeah? So the Buddha says, okay, what if they uh, throw stones at you? What, what if they hit you with sticks? Oh, it's okay, you know. What if they and it gets worse? You know? What if they hit you with a saw? What if a sharp saw? And lastly, what if they kill you? And this monk say, well, if they do that, then. I, I'm still happy because they have got rid of my body for me. So I, I don't have to do it myself, so to speak. I'm not just to meditate at that time. So in other words, he has, he has no fear of death and he has great compassion. So this is the this is the ideal teaching in Buddhism. Of course you may say, wow, that's impossible, right? Well, I wouldn't say impossible, it's possible. Mahatma Gandhi did it. And in many ways, as parents, we will also do this. We, we will not show violence to our children, for example. It is possible. Not easy, but possible. In other words, what the Buddha is teaching us is, is an ideal. You know? So you do not, even though we may not reach the ideal, but we try our best. It is possible. And sometimes we are given a choice. We are given a choice. You know? So when you are given the choice, of course, you, if you are given the proper training, you would not be violent. And if more and more people have this kind of idea, you'll find it's easier to get along. Right? And, and you notice uh, in, in Singapore, in, in a sense, we are heading towards a more violent streak in you know, society, or this road rage, for example. You know? So if we, I mean, if, if religion is missing, you know, you'll find this, this dark aspect of society is going to grow. So we need to teach this kind of quality from young. But of course, as lay people, we can take the middle way. So the question now is, how do we do this? So this is what we will discuss as we go along, or I will share with you as we go along. Yeah? So this, uh, this, the story goes like this. Uh, there is this monk called Paguna. Eh? OK, the sutta starts on page 12. The Pali word is right on the top of the page. Eh? Rakachupama, the word is on the board also. Yeah, it, it is resolved or broken up as kakacha, meaning the double handed saw. Then the upama means parable, comparison. M21. So, this is the, the main character here is a man called Molia Paguna. Now, he was not a, he's not a very strong man, he is very close to the nuns. Is uh, intimate with the nuns. And this is another thing which the Buddha discourages 
intimacy. In other words, the, the, you know, the monks, are, they, they, are, they are loving of each other in the loving kind of sense. But the Buddha always discouraged them from being intimate to another. Now, that is different. Intimate means you begin to miss people when they're not there. Then you can't meditate. Or you begin to get upset when they die, for example. So you find elsewhere, in other suttas, the Buddha even advised their people not to be attached to their teachers. Teachers teach you. Of course, you can show loving kindness in your thoughts, in your meditation, in your speech, in your action. That's the real respect you show your teacher, or any human being for that matter. But you don't get attached to them. Because the Buddha says you get attached to one particular teacher, then if this teacher one day makes a blunder, then you get upset. Or maybe if people don't expect this teacher, then you get very angry. And so, so you get affected in the place. So the idea is put the teaching about the teacher. That's the meaning. Eh? Uh, it's not that we don't care about people. This, this is the thing. Now, some people misunderstand that the Buddhists are cold. Not at all. What we're saying is don't have but no personality cult. And yet you show respect, love, kindness to your teachers, to your family members, to your fellow Buddhists and so on. That's the idea. No? Uh, a great kind of friendliness. But Aguna is different. He's very intimate to the nuns. Let's find out how. Okay? On page 12. Thus have I heard, at one time the Blessed One was staying in Anathapindekas Park in Jetta's Grove near Savati. Now at that time, the Venerable Moliya Pagunana was dwelling too intimately with the nuns. This was how intimate the Venerable Moliya Paguna was with the nuns. If anyone should speak ill of the nuns before him, he would disapprove and be angry and make an issue of it. If anyone should speak of the Venerable Molya Paguna before the nuns, they would disapprove and be angry and make an issue of it. So this is how. Right? So the other, they're so close to each other. If some talks bad about anything bad, what nuns do the monk, he gets upset. And if someone says, Paguna is like this, the nuns will get upset. So both sides, in Malay we say sama sama, right? kind of uh, wrong practice. Okay? So the monks have noticed this. Now, here again you see a part of the training. Okay? The monks notice this and uh, very often the monks will go to the Buddha <coughs> and tell the Buddha, then the Buddha will summon the monk and say, is it true or not? So the Buddha calls up Paguna, right? so you can see it. next section, the Buddha summons Molya Paguna. And the whole teaching we have read just now is repeated. The Buddha asks, is this true? Right. Do you know this? And then the Paguna says, yes. So you notice the next page, top paragraph there, the last line says, yes, one thing. Right. So in other words, here the Buddha wants to confirm, is it true or not? So the Buddha doesn't set away, accuse a person. So he wants to make sure this person hold up first. Right? But one more thing, very interesting, you should understand, this Sutta, Paguna is a bit hard-headed, lustful. In fact, he does not change. And yet, you find here, you have this long sutta, a very important sutta, a very frightening sutta, called Kakachubama Sutta, M21. You have this wonderful long sutta. Despite the fact that Paguna refuses to change, refuses to listen to the Buddha. This is very significant. It means that the Buddha does not merely teach because people will change immediately. But he has to teach because there is a problem here, there is an issue here, a, big, uh, a, a difficult situation here. So he has to address it because if he doesn't, it will get worse. Secondly, it would be very strange if every teaching the Buddha gave, or you know, everyone by light and straight away, again, be suspicious, somebody is writing stories, right? So there are a number of stories, a number of suttas, where you find the listener does not change. They, they either, we, we say in Singapore, they go blur, they don't know what's going on, you know, there are some cases like that. 
In other cases, they are just stubborn. They still feel they are right or that the Buddha is wrong. And yet the Buddha still gave that teaching. The question now is why? Well, one answer is this. You know, from the years I've been studying the Sutta, I would say the Buddha is teaching the monks. But even then, what is more important than that, when the Buddha teaches the monks, the teachings are preserved for us. He comes down to us to this day, 2,500 years later. Can you imagine, even as I gather here, there are five of you, <laughs> and uh, the, the Buddha has about five months. Eh? So this teaching is reenacted. So in a sense, every time we study a sutta, it's like we are replaying this teaching that the Buddha has given in the past. And of course, for us, we get more details because we are looking back what happened and so on, and we learn, we get this. We are inspired, our life changed accordingly. So, now the, the Buddha starts his teaching to Paguna. Okay? Notice, in, the, in this first part, the Buddha addresses Paguna directly. So, verse 5.2. Now, Paguna, are you not a son of family who is a renunciant, gone forth out of faith from home, for the homeless life? Yes, I am, Bhante. Right? So he, first he asks, are you not a monk? Right? You are a monk, right? Okay, so this is a negative language. No? And Paguna says, yes, I am. Then Buddha says, Paguna, it is not proper for a son of family who is a renunciant, gone forth out of faith from home into homelessness, okay, from, from home into the homeless, should dwell so intimately with the nuns. Right? So here the Buddha is going back to basics. Right? He says, you, you are a monk. You start the way a monk behaves. Notice, we have this great teacher, the Buddha, advising the monk in a very simple way, basic things. That, so, 6.2. Therefore, Bhaguna, even if someone were to speak ill of the nuns in your presence, on such an occasion, Paguna, you should not, uh, you should abandon, and it's not common, eh? you should abandon any householder's desire, any householder's thought. Okay, notice here, what's the Buddha saying here? You must not behave like a lay person, right? So here the Buddha is saying, if you are so intimate with the nuns, uh, with the nuns then you're just like a lay person. Right? So, now again, you have to be very careful, right? because a, a rather unwise or immature teacher might say, ah, you see here, the, the Buddha is saying it's okay for lay people to, to be uh, close with the nuns or, or close with other people or have affairs. No, that's not what the Buddha is saying. He's saying that to show such affection is like a lay person. Lay people tend to show affection. Right? Of course. It's not exactly wrong, but then again, we have another area that we talk about the precepts, right? Who you show affection to, how you show it, all these are, of course, uh, regulated by the precepts. So we've got to understand the context. Now remember the context of this chapter. Here the Buddha is telling Paguna not, uh, that there are rules for the monks, so keep to those rules. There, are, that there is the proper purpose for becoming a monk, to meditate, if you form intimate connection with the nuns is very hard to meditate. So here Buddha begins his uh, teaching of the graduated scale of treatment, if you like. So he says, someone speaks ill of the nuns, don't get upset. On such an occasion, Paguna, you should train yourself thus. My heart will be unperverted. My heart will not be twisted in any way. I won't be troubled in any way. Nor shall I utter any bad speech, yeah, never scold anyone. But I shall dwell with a heart of loving kindness, moved by goodness, without a hating heart. Notice, dwell with a heart of loving kindness, moved by goodness, without a hating heart. In other words, people can change. We try our best to say things so that people can change for the better sometimes. It's not always easy, but it's possible. In other words, do not show your anger. So if you 
gently go on doing that, somehow people will change in due course. And when they look back, they say, wow, this person has been very kind to me. Notice, if you remember the episodes in our life and our parents are very kind to us, very patient with us. We were naughty, we were difficult kids, but then they were patient with us. Look at there are times when, when we were in trouble too. But remember the good parts, how parents can be patient with us. And we ourselves try to be patient parents with our children in the spirit of this kind of teaching. Then 6.3, therefore, Bhaguna, even if someone in your presence were to strike those nuns with a hand, or hurl a clod of earth, or hit them with a stick, or strike them with a weapon, this series of things is very similar to the Buddha Vada Sutta, right? Where the violence get worse. So the Buddha says, even all this happens, you should never show hatred. But what's interesting here, what the Buddha didn't say, the Buddha didn't say you should not help the nuns, right? So I suppose the whatever the Paguna does, he can say positive things in other words. But the idea is not what the Buddha is again here we must not misinterpret this teaching by saying that it's okay to be violent with the nuns. No, that's not what the Buddha is saying either. What the Buddha is impressing on, on Paguna, you should not is so intimately involved in this way. In fact, it should be a, apart from the nuns, that's the best, right? Then you will be troubled with all these things. Because if you are really intimate to the nuns, and if they are hurt in this kind of way, you have to intervene, and there are going to be lots of issues, you know? Right? So this is the, what the, the Buddha is addressing the desire and lust in Paguna. And then, then the other way around, it says, uh, therefore, Paguna, even if anyone were to speak ill of you to your face, similar, on, that, on such an occasion, Paguna, you should abandon any householder's desires, any householder's thought. In this connection, Paguna, you should train yourself. Thus, my heart will be unperverted in any way, nor shall I utter any bad speech, but I shall dwell with a heart of loving kindness, moved by goodness without a hating heart. So even if someone were to treat you in the same way, scold you, throw a stone at you, hit you with a stick or weapon, still you should not show that hatred. This is the teaching given to Buddha also. Right? So right down to the middle of the book, uh, the page, eh? this is how Paguna you should train yourself. But apparently, even up to this point, Paguna did not respond. He didn't say yes, Mante. Yeah? Because, how do we know that? Look at the next section, section 7. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks. Now, big shoes, there was a time when the monks pleased to my heart. So notice, the Buddha switches this time to the monks. Why? Because Paguna didn't respond. He still feels he's right, sitting in the audience, but he just uh, somehow his mind still cluttered up. So the Buddha this time had a sister, monks. The Buddha didn't give up. The Buddha didn't chase him out. But he didn't actually break any big rules. So the Buddha was very patient with him. Here I address the monks thus. So here the Buddha is talking about the past. There was a time when these monks were all, they, they were really good and they, they made me very happy. So here I address the monks thus in the past. Eh? The Buddha says, Pictures, I take only a single session meal. Taking a single session meal, Pictures, I am free from illness and affliction and enjoy health and strength and dwell in comfort. Come now, Pictures, you too, take only a single session meal. Taking a single session meal, Pictures, you too will be free from illness and affliction and enjoy health and strength and dwell in comfort. There was no need of any of my instructor, instructing of those monks, big shoes. I had only to rouse mindfulness in them. So, why is the Buddha teaching here? So, two things. One is, he's reminding the monk, and of course, Vaguna, that there are many good monks, especially in the past. And it's almost like he's saying, well, time's a bit hard, you've got to put in more effort, you know. And secondly, Buddha says, I take only one meal a day. 
Because one of the things about eating a lot is it makes you become lustful. Because with all this excess energy, next day you want to uh, have babies, you know, for example. Right? So it is where the Buddha tells them not to restrict your food. Then it's easier to meditate, easier to be mindful. The Buddha didn't say go hungry. He no? says restrict your food. So these are, these are actual methods of overcoming desire. And then the Buddha gives a parable to show how, how easy it was for him to teach the monks those days. The parable of the chariot and the skilled chariot. Suppose big shoes, there was a chariot on good level ground at crossroads, harnessed to thoroughbreds with a wick on a slant. That means in the holder at the ready. So that the skilled charioteer, a trainer of tameable horses, might mount and taking the reins in his left hand and the whip in his right, drive out and back to whatever place and by whichever road he likes. Even so, Bhikshus, there was no need of my instructing those monks, Bhikshus. I had only to rouse mindfulness in them. So, now what's interesting here is this parable, it says of crossroads, you know, and this charioteer can go anywhere. So what do you think those crossroads represent? Four. The four satipatthanas, meditation. Eh? So what he's saying is, it's so easy, you can go anywhere, you can meditate so easily. And it's also uh, very easy to admonish, to teach the monks. Just like you have this chariot, you can go anywhere, very easy, the road is level. Eh? And they can meditate easily also. And then the Buddha gives a negative parable this time. Not use many parables in this sutta. The parable of the sal forest. The sal tree is very tall. It goes straight up. Very, very big tree. And the flowers grow straight out of the, of the main trunk. You, you might find this tree in the botanic garden setting. But the, you, you may have to wait. But maybe at this time. Yeah? Uh, this is spring, right? So the flowers should be coming up. So it's a sal tree. And this is a tree under which the Buddha was born. And the Buddha passed away. 8.1. Therefore, big shoes, abandon the unwholesome, right? Let go of the bad stuff. Devote yourself to the cultivating of wholesome states. That means mental loving kindness, mental peace, and so on. For that is how you will attain growth, abundance, full development in this Dharma Vinaya of teaching and discipline. In other words, keep the precepts, practice your meditation, and that's how you get wisdom. 8.2. Suppose, big shoes, there was a great sal forest, a tree, I mean a, a forest full of this kind of trees, sal trees, not far from a village or market town, and it were covered up by castor oil plants. Now, castor oil plants are not very high, you know? they're about a human height. I've seen them when I was a kid, I used to pluck the seeds, seeds are gone. The seeds look like tiny durians, you know. But uh, the thorns are very soft, but they're still prickly. When the seeds are dry, very sharp. And uh, th this kind of plants, they, they seem to absorb a lot of energy from the ground, so other plants won't be able to grow or won't be, won't be strong. So these are the castor plants. Eh? Now, there was a man desiring the good welfare, the freedom from bondage of those plants. Having cut away the bent plants that sap away the sour trees, he would throw them aside and then clear up the interior of the forest. Then he would take good care of, of salt plants so that they grow up straight and well. That is how it shoots. This salt forest would in time attain growth, abundance, food development. Right? So they remove these uh, plants which are not very useful and absorb the nutrients from the soil. So again, the Buddha reminds the man, without all negative states, cultivate positive states. Now, the Buddha has some more stories. Uh, this next story is the parable of the lady Uede Hika and her woman slave Kali. This is a very, it's a, meant to be taken humorously. Huh? It's a story of a woman who 
shows that she's very calm, very peaceful. But inside, she's not. So she's only pretending to show, right? So this parable, or this, this actually is a real story according to Pasita, real person. So the Buddha is telling this uh, Paguna and monks generally, you should not just pretend to be very peaceful monks, you know, very uh, pleasant, very holy, but inside you're full of desires. Just like Paguna, see Paguna is very attached to the monks. So the story goes like this, 9.1. Once upon a time, big shoes, in this very same Sawaki, there was a house lady or householder's wife named Wedehika. Big shoes, the house lady Wedehika's good reputation has spread about us. The house lady Wedehika is gentle, the house lady Wedehika is humble, the house lady Wedehika is calm. Okay, so that's her reputation. Yeah? Now, big shoes. The house lady, Vidhika's woman slave, named Kali, was capable, diligent, and careful in her work. This then big shoes, this occurred to the woman slave Kali. Her house lady Vidhika's good reputation has been spread about. Thus, not that she is gentle, humble, and calm, right? Now what now? Is there actually anger within my lady? Only that she does not show it, or is there really not? Is it just this task of mine that have been carefully done that my lady is calm, but there is actually anger in her, only that she does not show it, or is there really not? And now I investigate the lady. Right, so we have this, uh, this house, house slave. The house slave are very interesting people, you know, so although the, the word doesn't sound very nice in English, there is a difference between a house slave and what is called is uh, uh, people you 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 pay you know, to work, hired workmen, hired laborers. Uh, see, hired laborers is on contract, you see? so they got to fulfill the job, their task, what they are paid for. So they have very, very little freedom. The house slave, on the other hand, is like a family, like a family member. So very often, she behaves like a family member. So she works, but she's like part of family. In other words, the house slave can wake up one day and say, oh, I have a headache today, I'm sick, I can't work. And then, and then she, don't, she doesn't have to work. But not the hired workman, if you understand, right? So in that sense, the house slave actually has more freedom. Sometimes they, they go a little overboard, you know, like, like in this case, you know, in this house slave, Kali, she decides to test her lady, her house, her, her, her mistress, you know, her master, her mistress. So the Buddha is telling this story, partly it's rather a humorous uh, side, uh, side, if you like, that even a house slave can test whether her mistress is really, honestly, uh, what she shows herself to be. But in this case, she only pretends to be calm and gentle and peaceful you know, when she is not. So this is what she does. Again, you see here a similar pattern, you know, this uh, gradual scale of treatment. Eh? So what does she do? She start doing, uh, she start getting lazy, in the, you know, increasingly lazy to test the lady. 9.4. Then big shoes, the woman slave, Kali woke up late in the day. She woke up a bit late. Eh? Then big shoes, the house lady Vedika said this to the woman slave Kali. Hey you Kali, what is it, madam? She asked. What what's this? You got up late in the day. And then she's the slave says, It's nothing at all, madam. Nothing? The, the matter's in nothing's the matter indeed, you bad slave, you got up late. She was angry, displeased, and frowned. Okay, so in other words, she just showed up the face on him, she didn't do anything. Then we choose this occur to the woman's lips. Although my lady shows no anger, it is still present in her, not absent. So, and then she thinks, okay, it's just because I still do my work well, so she's not upset, but inside her, there's still anger. Now, you know, this kind of story is meant to be dramatized, you know. Now, if you don't study drama and literature, you will say, well, you know, this kind of story, you know, you, you kind of, you might even say something's wrong here, you know. 
But if you are a dramatic producer, you are a literary person, you know literature is here, and you tell a story, you can turn it into a play. And this is the kind of story that is uh, very interesting. Because it, it can teach people, even ent entertain people, right? Because here you, you see this, this slave is very brave. She's going to test her, her, her own mistress, whether she's really sincerely kind or just pretend to be so. So, she said, let me examine her a little more. All right, so next page, 9.6. Then big shoes, the woman's slave, got up later in the day. And then the house lady again scolded her and said, hey, you, why you got up late? You know? And then the, the, the slave says, no, it's nothing at all. Okay. Right? And then the mistress says, nothing's the matter indeed, you bad slave. You got up even later. She was angry, displeased, and uttered words of displeasure. That's right, getting worse now, right? First, first part, she just frowned, you know, just show her a sad face, that's all. She didn't say anything. Now she started uttering, she started scolding the slave. So you can imagine, then, then she said, let me test her again. So this time the slave got her even later in the day, and then the, the mistress says, why got up so late? There was nothing. <laughs> and this time, she got very angry. Okay, can you look at 9.8? Go down. The, the, the slave says, Nothing's the matter indeed. Uh, no, sorry, the, the, the lady says, Nothing's the matter indeed, you bad slave. You got up even later in the day. She was angry, displeased, and taking a door bolt, struck her head and cut it. A door bolt, you know, this uh, piece of wood, you know, where you lock the door. It's quite big, you know. Not cut. So she's violent, right? So that means she's not really what she shows herself to be. Then, 9.9. .9. Then, big shoes, the woman slave, Kali, with blood streaming down her head, complained to the neighbors. Okay, this is the, the, court, the, the local court, they were like. See, madams, an action of the gentle one. See, madams, an action of the humble one. See, madams, an action of the calm one. Okay, this, of course, this is called sarcasm. <laughs> okay. so, so, it's trying to prove, look, my mistress is not what she shows herself to be. So, here you have a bit of comedy also, you know. I mean, I see you're smiling, right? So uh, there's a bit of uh, sadness and a bit of humor. Because here, what the, the story is trying to tell us not to be hypocritical, right? In other words, you, you show yourself to be calm, you should also act calm. You show yourself to be kind, you, you should also act kind. So you find today, uh, you know, it's like a politician, very nice, that people <laughs> you really help well. You got to light up, you know, whatever, okay? Of course, in Singapore, we, we often get things done, you know? But what I'm saying is, if you behave political, right? Then you just have nice, smile to people when there's no problem. When there's a problem, you, you're not there, you know, then of course, we, we, we are not a true person. So what the Buddha is saying, you must be a real, real true to yourself, and, and really be responsive to people and so on, okay? So, here, this house lady, Vedika, is in reality fierce, not humble, and not calm at all. Right? And it's something we should not be. Now then there's the So the teaching then is this, the Buddha says, even so big shoes here, a a certain monk appears to be very gentle, very humble, very calm, but the as long as no disagreeable cause of words touches him. So here the story also is very closely directed to Paguna. The Buddha says, you, you may pretend to be a very calm, mindful, kind, compassionate monk. So as, as long as the nuns are not in trouble, or you, you show that calmness. Huh? But once there's any problem, then you become violent. So where's your training? Right? So that's the teaching. So the Buddha says you have to be calm inside out. Your action and your looks are both calm and peaceful and compassionate. 10.3. And who is the monk who is really tractable? Tractable that means can be taught, can be trained. But big shoes when the monk honoring the Dharma, respecting the Dharma, esteeming the Dharma, venerating the Dharma, 
revering the Dharma is tractable and makes himself tractable. Him, I say, to be the one who is tractable. Right? Then the Buddha repeats it. Eh? You should, this is what you should do. Respect the Dharma. In other words, train yourself in the teaching. And this is what you know. we, we try to tell people here. Respect the suttas. Respect the Dharma. The more you understand the suttas and the Dharma, the more truly kind you'll be to people. You will not disrespect the monks. You will not use the monks and the nuns for worldly purposes. And the monks and nuns themselves will be tractable. They will learn the Dharma. And this is what we should be, in other words. Eh? So even as we teach others, we also need to learn ourselves. So as we learn, we teach others. As we teach, we learn. Then the Buddha goes on to talk about speech, five kinds of rights, five kinds of speeches. So here, section 11.1, which shows there are these five paths of speech, five ways of talking, that others use to speak to you. That is to say, timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with the goal or unconnected with the goal, with loving kindness or with a hating heart. So then everything's repeated. And the, the Buddha says, uh, when someone speaks to you, the, the person may speak to you at the right time or at the wrong time. Two possibilities, one good, one bad. Or the person may tell you something true or something false. You got to observe. The person may tell you in a gentle, loving way or in a very harsh way. It's like of life. And this person may talk to you about something connected with the Dharma or not connected with the Dharma. Even if you go to any temples on Sunday, you find not everybody talk Dharma. After Dharma talks, you find people start talking, oh, you know, I went to Ginting, you know, like this, like that, gambling. Eh? And everyone might say, oh, you know, uh, I actually went to the IR. You know, IR is a big thing, you know, actually. You know. So they begin to talk about things that are not connected with the goal, not connected with the Dharma. Right? So, and sometimes they talk with loving kindness, so not without loving kindness. Sometimes they talk with, with anger. Yeah? They might even shout, right? Maybe the husband got dragged to the temple when the wife the husband got the husband got upset you can hear he lost his temple. Or maybe it's the wife that got upset. You know? So this all these things happen, you know? So how are we to do? How are we to train ourselves? Eleven point three. Very big shoes, you should train yourself thus. Our hearts will be unperverted in any way. We won't get upset in any way. Nor shall we utter any bad speech. But we shall dwell with the heart of loving kindness, moved by goodness without a hating heart. And we will dwell pervading that person with a heart attended by loving kindness. So direct your loving kindness to the angry person, to the negative person. And based on that, or in beginning there, if you like, we will dwell pervading the whole world with the heart attended by loving kindness. Vast, grown great, boundless, free from hate, free from evil. Right? Direct the person to everyone else. So this is how we create this very wonderful healing environment. Especially in a good situation. Of course, some of you, you will not be thinking, oh yeah, what about my work situation? Not easy, you know? This sort of thing, huh? the problem will continue and grow, right? Well, let me put it this way, for your own health, you must maintain this. You know, when you get angry, what do you notice? Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, face is red and, and ugly, of course. So you can't do this, your lifespan is going to be shorter and you're not going to be very healthy, you're not happy. And you don't really make friends and your rebirth is not going to be good. So the point here is, people may show anger, but you try to train yourself to be calm and peaceful. And then you can be firm. Uh, you can be understanding. In fact, it's easier to listen to problems you write that way. Just because you are full of love and kindness and, and, and uh, calm doesn't mean you are weak, not at all. You know, a lot of people out there who don't like the suttas, who are afraid of the suttas, the suttas say don't, months don't touch money, should be kind to people, and some are not like that, so they don't like to hear the suttas. <coughs> and sometimes they, they're not happy with me teaching the suttas. Some of them even try to stop me teaching the suttas. But most of them, they're not meet me personally. 
they somehow for some reason they won't, they did not come to me and look in the eye and you know kind of like talk face to face because I asked them what is it you're upset about what is it you don't like in the suttas I mean you you call yourself a Buddhist uh, so why why do you why do you do all these things and they have no answers so they always do furtively hide their evil deeds or bad deeds you know? so. We show these people loving kindness. So when you show loving kindness, their bad stuff in their heart, they just find they cannot fit. It. But if only they can change, it's really wonderful. So it's very, you know, that's why compassion is so important. You find some people because of their past and their present in some ways, they're unable to see goodness in others and they expand the faults of others, make a big deal of what they see as faulty in others. They're not really happy people. So you need to show them a lot of loving kindness and in that way maybe try to make them happy because when they're truly happy, then they also be kind to others. It's not an easy thing to do, but this is the training we are given by the Buddha. And maybe one day they will look at themselves and say, oh dear, I should be kind myself to be happy. Then the Buddha gives a set of parables. This actually is a meditation on loving kindness. You can use this. You know? It's very similar to the set given by the Buddha to his son, Rahula. In the Maha Rahula Vada Sutta, the Buddha taught the elements meditation to the son. Tells Rahula, reflect in this way. May I be like the earth? The earth, people dig it, throw rubbish on it, clean things, dirty things, but the earth does not complain. The, the, the earth is not disgusted. The earth is not angry. May I be like earth? Water also. Fire, wind. May I be like that? See, these four elements are actually what our body really is. So the mind can be peaceful in that way. Here, the Buddha also uses the earth here. Okay, let's look at this very interesting uh, reflection in the section 12. The parable of trying to dig up the earth. The parable of someone uh, trying to dig up the earth. Yeah? Suppose big shoes, a man were to come along bringing a hoe and a basket and were to say this, I will make this whole earth to be normal earth. And he would digging here and there, strewing earth about here and there, spitting on it here and there, peeing on it here and there, saying, this will be no, no more be earth. This will no more be earth. What do you think, Big Shoes? Would this man be able to make this great earth no more earth? Not at all, Bante. Here you see that the monks respond, eh? But we're not going to respond at all. And what is the reason for this? And the monk said, this great earth, Bhante, is deep, not to be measured. It would be easy to make her normal earth. It, it would not be easy to make her normal earth. In due course, he would only have his share of weariness and disappointment. Right? So imagine, you know, earth. People try to dig up the earth, try to remove the earth. It, it's impossible. Right? So here, meaning what? The Buddha says, okay, the, there are these five kinds of speeches. Remember, someone can tell you something at the wrong time, at the right time, true and true, gentle or harsh, connected with the Dharma or not connected with the Dharma, with loving kindness or without loving kindness. People tell you things in different ways. Just be calm. Because they cannot hurt you. They cannot remove your goodness. Be like the earth. They can dig away. Eh? but they will never be able to remove the earth. Because when you dig earth, you go over there, still back to earth. <laughs> right? So, this is a very wonderful reflection. Be like the earth. Next one. Parable of trying to draw pictures in space. Suppose, big shoes, a person were to come along with lack or turmeric or cloud gray or crimson. Okay, These are the different colors artists use in Buddhistan. And he were to say, I will paint a picture in the air or in the sky. I will create a form. What do you think, Big Shoes? Would this person be able to paint a picture in the air or create a form? Right. So, we have colors, or even use markers, you know, 
can you draw in the air? You can't. So here, again, same thing. The Buddha is, is, it goes back to the teaching. He says people will talk to you in a different way, true, false, connected with the Dharma, and so on, or not connected with the Dharma. People talk in all kinds of different ways. Don't get upset. Just be at peace with yourself. Just like someone, even with all kinds of colors. So all this right speech, bad, wrong speech, they are like colors. You know? They can't draw in the air. So if you have loving kindness, they can't hurt you. Amazing and terrible thing, huh? And then next one, the parable of someone trying to burn up the Ganges with a grass torch. So you notice you have elements one by one, right? First earth element, second is what? Wind, yeah? And third one is fire. So here, section 16. Suppose we choose a man who to come, bringing along a blazing grass torch. And he were to say, with this blazing grass torch, I will heat up the river Ganges and boil it away. So Buddha asked, what do you think, man? So, can you do that? He says, it's going to burn all the water in the Ganges river until it evaporates, so to speak. Yeah? So here, we reflect on the water in the river. And uh, all those words, people say, timely, untimely, true, untrue, gentle, harsh, and so on. All the kind of speeches that come to us, they are like the fire torch. Let it come. So you, so you, if you picture like that, you say, okay, all this was per se, then choose your favorite par parable. You know? I like the river Ganges. So you find, let them say what they are. They have their reasons. Right? So let them say, let me hear. And I won't be upset. I will show my loving kindness to them. This is one thing about Dharma teachers. We have to do that, you know. And if you don't, then. You people will know. There are many uh, speakers, you know, really speakers with titles, big titles, you know, they, they come and give talks in public. This is one of the reasons why sometimes I rather not go for such talks. Because you can be quite disappointed with them in a the sense that they, they show to be great Dharma speakers and so on, but they are not. For example, there was one, you know, this speaker, a monk, and supposed to be also a scientist. You know, and someone asked him a science question. He says, uh, so uh, when does life, according to Buddhism, when does life begin? It's a valid question. When does life begin on Earth, you know? And I was surprised that he, he could not answer this question because he could answer from the Aganya Sutta or even from science. You know? I mean, there are different ways of answering this question. He, he simply said, and in fact, there are three people at that time, three speakers. So they, they started looking at each other, who's going to answer. So in the end, one of the, uh, the monk said, Why? Well, I mean, you ask such a difficult question, huh? you obviously know the answer already yourself. That's the first answer, which is shocking. It means you're talking down to the person, say, Why? Well, you think you're so clever to ask such a question. Then the other person says, Oh, okay, la. when does life begin? La? Life begins at 60 you know, or 50. <laughs> No, so he's trying to trivialize this question. So this poor student, I don't know how he's going to feel after that. He, he came for a Buddhist talk and then this is the answer he got. So he's going to go with a very unhappy talk. That is rather sad, isn't it? So these are questions which could have been answered, which have been uh, you know, uh, discussed. Right? So here you find the speakers did not practice all these teachings where they, they should keep calm or at least respond with a positive, in a positive way. Then the, the last parable, no? it's a parable, oh, no, there's one more. The last one is the most dramatic. This is second last. The parable of the catskin bag. Now, to be honest with you, I'm still not sure what a catskin bag is. I'm not sure if it's really catskin or not, you know. Mm -hmm. Because the Buddhists wouldn't skin a cat. But here, yeah, it is a name of a, a bag with very smooth uh, outside, like cat's fur. Like that. So the, the fur is very nice and smooth, all right? So, okay, this is the parable, 18.1. 18.1. Suppose big shoes, there were a bag of cat skin, scrubbed and beaten so that it is made supple, very supple, thoroughly supple, soft like cotton, like cat's fur. Then a man were to come along with a stick of potsherd, potsherd is a piece of broken pot piece, eh? 
and were to say, this bag of cat skin scrub and bitten so that it, it is made supple, very supple, thoroughly supple, soft like cotton, I will make a scrubbing and beating sound with it, with a stick or butcher. Right? So you can try, but it's so soft, you know. It's just like you have layers of clothes, right? you try and beat it, very soft sound. So there's not much sound there. Right? <coughs> so this is another uh, reflection we can use. Imagine uh, like a soft fur bag. You know, people can try to hit it with a stick, but the sound is very soft. Right? So I will not uh, you know, uh, react in a negative way. Those words are like sticks and stones, but I'll be gentle, soft, just like the cat skin bag. So these are the various parables of the uses. And finally, the Buddha closes with a really dramatic parable that gives the Sutta the title. 20, session 20. Big shoes. Even if low down thieves were to cut you up from limb to limb with a double handle saw, and if you were to defile your mind with anger, you are thereby not the doer of my teaching. Therein, big shoes, you should train yourself in this way. Our hearts will be unperverted in any way, nor shall we utter any bad speech, but we shall dwell with a heart of loving kindness, moved by goodness, with a hate, without a hating heart. We will dwell pervaded. Uh, we were dwell pervading that person, not, not, not pervaded, eh? pervading that person with a heart attended by loving kindness. Based on that, we were dwell pervading the whole world with a heart attended by loving kindness. Vast, strong, great, boundless, free from hate, free from evil. This is how we should, you should train yourself. If big shoes, this exhaustion on the power of the saw were to be borne in mind constantly by you, would you see any cause of speech trivial or gross you could not endure? Like the Buddha says, if you understand this parable, you can stand any kind of talk that people throw at you. Then the nuns at the monks of this in all contain. Therefore, big shoes, Constantly keep in mind this exhortation on the power of the soul. It will be for your good and happiness for a long time. The Blessed One said this. The monks joyfully approve of the Blessed One's word. Notice that Buddha is silent all the way. Okay. Now, this last parable is the tricky one. Anyone, any thoughts on this? Do you think it's easy to practice? Not at all. Eh? Now, why did the Buddha tell the monks, even if robbers would to catch you, low down robbers, no, not the king or someone good, eh? but to cut you in half with a sword, you should not show anger in your head. Because if you do that, then you're, you have gone against my teaching. This thought just came to me as I'm teaching you. That's already this happens in the Dhamma teaching. You see, if this man were to die, being cut like that shirt, I mean, someone cut like that shirt to die, right? So the Buddha is saying, the Buddha didn't say here, but indirectly, implicitly, the Buddha is saying, you must maintain loving kindness because death is coming, you see? So if you, mean, if you have angry thoughts, then you'll be reborn, unhappy state. You see, that makes sense, right? So once you understand that, you find the Buddha is not actually telling us that violence is good. He's not saying, oh, let, let somebody cut me out with a sword. No, he's not saying that. He said, these people there, they're going to kill you, so you must cultivate loving kindness, then your rebirth will be okay. And after all, if you show anger, what's the point? You, you can't help it anyway. Right? Again, here, we're talking about not a likely situation, but what if situation. In the worst case, the Buddha said, you should not show loving, uh, should not show anger. To still show loving kindness. So what the Buddha is saying, I'm in business in my teaching. Be non-violent. Because if the monks are not a good example, then who else can we follow? Right? But sadly in other countries, especially in China, Japan, Korea, you find these monks they practice karate and, and Shaolin and, and uh, there, there are Sohe in Japan who are warrior monks and, and we think they're great people, you know? Like Shaolin monks are becoming a big thing. And, you know? 
but it's all against the Buddha's teaching. So that's why we got to go back to the suttas, to, to really what's, what is what the Dharma is for. Again, don't misunderstand why I'm trying to teach here, because uh, the disciple call me a radical, the disciple call me a fundamentalist. Uh, actually, I'm happy with those words. Fundamentalist is a very nice word. It means to go back to the fundamental teachings of the Buddha. You know? Because a Buddhist, two Buddhists will never go around burning down other temples because they don't like suttas. <laughs> I mean, but uh, and what we're saying here is, you 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 have every choice of what the kind of Buddhism you want or no Buddhism. But if you are wise, you will know what to choose, what teaching to choose. If you want peace of mind. You want you want emotional independence. You will know what to choose. Some people are not ready. Some people they're confused. So obviously they will choose confused teachings. We're not out here to destroy anybody, but we are here to help people who want to be happy, who wants to change. So the parable of the soul is telling us, even the worst thing happens to us, we must not give up the training. Try our best to stay to the training. It's not easy. The Buddha never said, living in the world is easy. But we can try. And there are many who have succeeded. So this is a reminder for us that we have the capacity for success no matter what challenges we face. Any questions? Yes, sure. Specific training to mm -hmm. achieve the kind of calmness and uh, overconfidence. Okay. We were moved by all this. Yes. Uh -huh. So, external uh, distractions yeah. and sufferings. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a special training on in practice? Like? Well, remember the parables. There's so many parables here, half a dozen mm -hmm. parables in the Sutta. You study them and then choose one. So it's a reflection. You, you reflect on the parables. That is the Buddhist prayer. It is a wordless prayer. I like to call it wordless. You don't use words. You use feelings. So if someone hurts you, you get into this feeling mode. See, because if you use words, they're harder. You, know? you get distracted more easily. But you can use words if you like as, as, as the beginning, but gently let go of the words as you become more calm. Okay? For example, let's say someone says something nasty to you, so you visualize yourself on earth. Earth is stable, it's not shaken by all these words. Or oh, I'm a mountain, rocky mountain, and these are the four winds blowing here, blowing there. The four winds are like the strong speech. May I be like a mountain. Now once you think like that, it's easier, because you're telling your mind, be strong. It's just like before a football game, the coach will give a pep talk you know, to the, uh, the, the team, right? So here you tell yourself, okay, be calm. So you visualize yourself. Why? Because other people will get very angry. If they start thinking to yourself, who, who does this person think is? Uh, I am this, I am that. Uh, that's the thing of I, me, mine. Then you own the pain. Then it's going to get worse. So these are ways of disowning the pain, all these parables. So look at the parables, choose the one that you like, easy for you, you can connect with. And that will heal you. That's the prayer. Okay. Any other questions? Our questions are useful. Please ask, eh? that is how you can actually connect with the suttas. Okay. Any others? Okay, so that's our first discourse. Eh? So we end here, and no questions. Okay, so let us do a short reflection. All right, today we have reflected on the Kakachu Pramasutta, how to be patient, how to be non-violent. It's a very powerful teaching. Although you might feel that we're not strong enough to be so patient and non-violent like the great monks, the arahats of the past, we know there is this vision, very high vision, that keeps Buddhism gentle and peaceful and yet effective truly effective as a spiritual teaching, not as a worldly power, not in terms of controlling people, but freeing people, freeing ourselves. And it is through a lot of wonderful, great, and good merits we have accumulated to be able to study this substance. By the power of all these good deeds we have done, may our minds quickly focus here and now 
May we be at peace with ourselves. May we be happy at this time in our life. By all this, by all faith in the three jewels, by all the good deeds we have done, our, our keeping to the precepts, our own practice of meditation, practice of generosity, and various other good deeds. May we attain spiritual liberation in this life itself. At this peaceful moment too, let us send out our loving kindness to all those people who have been kind to us and to everyone that comes to mind. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu.